So it just okay. runs right to the speaker, but I didn't mind that. <laughs> don't come here for me. <laughs> I'm not here for you. Well, All that was right. a really nice intro you gave me before. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, I am going to get started um, because we're still recording live. Um, and actually, turn off the thing first. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us as we continue our week nine Chautauqua Lecture Series theme, which is our Lifelong Scholars Week, uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Uh, my name is Dakota Harkins, and I'm the Director of Education and Heritage Programming here at Lakeside Chautauqua. And I'm very glad to be welcoming back this afternoon, Dr. Katherine Jellison. Uh, Dr. Jellison is a history professor at OU, and she was here with us this morning to tell us about the origins of the suffrage movement, which a lot of times go back much further than we realize when the movement in general. Uh, if you happen to miss her program this morning, it was recorded and it is on the Facebook page, the Lakeside Chautauqua Facebook page, and is available on the Lakeside YouTube page as well. Um, as always, if you have issues uh, accessing those, you can contact me at dharkins at lakesideohio.com. Um, but with that, I would love to turn it over now to Dr. Jellison so she can get started on um, her second lecture. And uh, welcome back, Dr. Jellison. It's good to have you again. Thanks for welcoming me back. This morning must have done okay if you brought me back this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull up my slides here. Um, the road to suffrage. We're going to uh, cover the 30 years between uh, 1860 and 1890 this afternoon. And then tomorrow I'm going to give a couple of lectures uh, about the 20th century and the achievement of suffrage and um, the immediate aftermath. Anyway, um, this morning I talked about the uh, pre-Civil War period and uh, I want to start this afternoon talking about the suffrage movement during the Civil War. If you were uh, tuned in to my comments this morning, you know that the origins of the women's movement, the 19th century women's movement, and the crusade for suffrage were a direct outgrowth of the abolitionist movement of uh, the first half of the 19th century. So it probably will come as no surprise to you that during the Civil War, uh, suffragists put uh, the crusade for the vote uh, a bit on the back burner. And because most suffragists uh, were also abolitionists, put their attention to uh, creating a 13th Amendment to the US Constitution that would abolish slavery. Um, as I noted this morning, the women's movement was uh, strictly a, a Northern phenomenon prior to the Civil War and during the Civil War. Uh, there was no Southern women's movement because again, uh, the suffrage movement or women's movement was so tied to the anti-slavery cause. It was a specifically Northeastern and Midwestern movement. So uh, these women's rights advocates in the North during the Civil War formed something that goes by a couple of different names. One is the Women's National Loyal League. Sometimes they referred to themselves as the Women's Loyal National League. Um, on this slide, I have used the more common of the two names, the Women's National Loyal League. And this organization of uh, suffragists who were also abolitionists, uh, spent the Civil War period collecting signatures to petitions for a 13th Amendment. By the time the Civil War ends in 1865, people like uh, well-known suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, had gathered 400,000 signatures to petitions for a 13th Amendment to the Constitution that would end slavery. Now, obviously, uh, because most suffragists uh, were also abolitionists, this is something that the women of the Women's National Loyal League totally believed in. They wanted to abolish slavery. Um, 
through their decades of anti-slavery activism, uh, the women who were behind this uh, petition campaign had come up with several strategies for ending slavery. Um, the idea of a constitutional amendment had not always been at the forefront of their minds uh, because most reformers in the first half of the 19th century really didn't trust the federal constitution. Uh, they did not approve of the three-fifths rule when it came to counting enslaved persons in the South as three-fifths of a person. So they saw it as a document that inherently um, propped up slavery, recognized and did not challenge the concept of slavery. Uh, by the time we get to the Civil War, however, some of the thinking has changed and one means of perhaps ending slavery is an amendment to the US Constitution. And as noted, this is what a lot of the suffragists put their minds and energies to during the war. So they want an end to slavery, but there is also the hope that if you have a 13th Amendment to the US Constitution, uh, which obviously fundamentally changes the Constitution, maybe that document, maybe the US Constitution can become a tool of reform. Once you eliminate it as a pro-slavery document and it instead with the 13th Amendment becomes an anti-slavery document, it can become a document that is an instrument of reform. Maybe other amendments can be added that will change not only the status of African-American people, um, but the status of all women in US society as well. Uh, following the Civil War and the Union victory comes the period uh, of Reconstruction, those 12 years following the Civil War in which the federal government is um, invested uh, financially and militarily and legislatively in remaking, reconstructing the South uh, to bring it into conformity with um, the social and economic and legal uh, standards of the North. This is one of my favorite artistic portrayals of the Reconstruction era. This is uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, it portrays uh, black men who have served with the Union military returning to their communities and families here at war's end, the end of the war and the beginning of reconstruction. And it um, shows people in the town square here, uh, people greeting one another, the uh, couple at the center of this drawing always uh, make me think of that Alfred Eisenstadt very famous photograph of the end of World War II, uh, the sailor and the nurse in Times Square. Uh, but the couple embracing here at the center of the drawing and the, their child rushing up to greet the father. Um, this is such a good representation of the fact that African-Americans freed themselves, were active participants in their own emancipation this uh, image of the returning black soldier and returning uh, to their families, to their friends and their loved ones. What will this period of reconstructing the South mean for African-Americans as well as other uh, denizens of the United States? Well, first of all, we do have 13 uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, excuse me, amendments to the Constitution that come to us via uh, the project of Reconstruction. Uh, the 13th Amendment and slavery, 1865. The 14th Amendment, 1868, defines citizenship. The 15th Amendment, 1870, gives black men the right to vote. And here is a cover illustration of the 15th Amendment from Harper's Weekly, uh, showing a cross-section of uh, Black American males voting. Uh, the farmer, uh, the businessman, uh, the union veteran lining up to vote. But notice, of course, the sex 
uh, it is all men because the 15th Amendment only grants men the right to vote. And it is that um, fact that will shape the suffrage movement through the remainder of the 19th century. The wording of the 15th Amendment um, and the understanding of the 14th Amendment uh, will have a definite influence on the suffrage movement going forward. Well, let's look at some of this language specifically. Uh, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, 1868, all persons, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. The magic word there for our purposes this afternoon is persons. Of course, the 14th Amendment goes on to say, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Uh, some of the most important language in our Constitution as amended during the Reconstruction period. 15th Amendment, 1870, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. There is a key word missing there uh, for many suffragists, and that is the word sex. The right to vote shall not be denied because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The presence of these three amendments to the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, caused suffragists and other 19th century reformers to look at the Constitution in a new way. Will the Constitution now be the right to expanding freedom? And freedom for whom? For African Americans, this is an illustration of the 15th Amendment. And in many ways, an illustration of what Reconstruction meant to Black Americans. Uh, it meant education. You see down here in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, it had been illegal during slavery for enslaved persons to learn to read and write. Now, children and adults are flocking uh, to schools to gain that education that had been not denied them for so long. Legal marriage in the next image down there at the bottom. Um, I tell my students there are two activities uh, that former enslaved people rushed uh, to embrace. One was education, the other was to give their committed relationships legal standing for the first time because during slavery, enslaved people's marriages did not have the recognition by law. And various of the other uh, components of African American life that are illustrated here in this um, image celebrating the 15th Amendment. Uh, political participation, office holding, military leadership, uh, all of these activities that had been denied the majority of African Americans, uh, they now rush to embrace and with the power and influence of the federal government behind them, African-Americans, the large majority of which still live in the South at this time, uh, with the federal government occupying the South, uh, with the federal government having influence in the former Confederacy, these goals can become realities. 
But not only is this a particular image that's celebrating the 15th Amendment, uh, telling us, uh, looking at it, uh, and certainly people who looked at it at the time in 1870, the message is not only these are activities that are occurring now during this period of reconstruction, these first 12 years after the Civil War, but these are the possibilities going forward. We will continue uh, to have full citizenship rights now that black men, like white men, have the right to vote in US society. But uh, as we know, when Reconstruction ends, the federal government loses interest in remaking the South part of a political compromise coming out of the election of 1876. And uh, the reconstruction reforms don't have permanence. And contrary to the language that you just saw on your screens and I just read to you, saying uh, that no state shall be able to abridge these uh, federally granted through the US Constitution uh, rights of citizenship no state is supposed to be able to do that. Uh, but when Reconstruction ends in 1877, that's exactly what happens. And we have um, state and local governments in the South being, um, to use the term of the time, redeemed uh, by former Confederates and the rights that were supposedly granted by constitutional amendment being taken away. And it won't be, of course, until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s uh, that those rights will be restored through most of the South. Uh, at the time, however, at the time that the Reconstruction Amendments become part of the Constitution, there is the belief that there is permanence here, that these are permanent reforms. And many uh, suffragists say, and this is the way, this is the way to do it. This is the way to bring about reform and permanent reform, to bring it about through the US Constitution. But there is um, a division in the suffrage community. There is a division in the women's rights movement over the wording of this 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, will it, and the other Reconstruction Amendments change life permanently for African Americans and for all women. That remains to be seen. The 15th Amendment is embraced by one faction of the women's movement. They don't like the idea that uh, that word sex has been left out of the 15th Amendment uh, that is only granted black male suffrage, but they will still endorse the amendment. And that faction of the women's rights movement is headed by the woman you see here on your left, Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell. They are longtime uh, women's rights advocates and abolitionists. And they will not renounce the 15th Amendment, even though women have not been included in that amendment. And they form an organization here in 1869, as the amendment is about to, in the following year, 1870, become part of the Constitution. Uh, Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, form an organization known as the American Woman Suffrage Association, the American Woman Suffrage Association. If you're wondering why they have two different last names, like, again, like so many of the people I talked about this morning, they were way ahead of their time. Um, when they married, she said she would uh, keep her original surname and uh, her new husband, Henry Blackwell, was fine with that. So uh, here in the middle decades of the 19th century, a married woman who kept her original surname was called a Lucy Stoner uh, because she was following in the footsteps of Lucy Stone. Um, so the American Woman Suffrage Association is pro 15th Amendment. We endorse it. 
Um, and rather than look to the Constitution uh, to give women the right to vote, we will work by changing voting laws state by state, take a state by state approach. That is the stance of the AWSA, the American Women's Suffrage Association, under the leadership of Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell. Uh, we want women's suffrage. Uh, disappointed in the wording of the 15th Amendment, but we will endorse it because we, you know, we feel very good about it in, term, in terms of giving black men the right to vote. Uh, so we will take a different tact to try to get women the right to vote. We will do that by changing laws uh, at the state level one at a time. The other uh, competing branch of the women's rights movement uh, here during the Reconstruction era is founded by Elizabeth Cady Stanton here at the left in the photograph on your right. And uh, to her left, your right, is Susan B. Anthony. They form an organization called the National Woman Suffrage Association. The NWSA is anti amendment is anti 15th amendment because uh, Stanton and Anthony are so angry that the 15th amendment did not include that word sex, that they renounce it altogether, even though they are both veterans of the suffrage, uh, obviously the suffrage movement of the abolitionist movement. And they had been among those who had gathered those 400,000 signatures uh, to end slavery with the 13th Amendment. So uh, they have been uh, strong proponents of black rights, but are really angry that only black male voting rights were recognized in the 15th Amendment. Here was an opportunity to expand suffrage, to expand the franchise to all adult citizens and only black men received that right. Um, there was a famous exchange between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, a member, a famous member of Congress at this time, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, uh, a long time uh, ally of Elizabeth Cady Stanton in the abolitionist movement and in the women's movement. And when she uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton protested the wording of the 15th Amendment, saying, you know, what, what is granted to women here? Nothing. Nothing is granted to women here. Sumner says to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, this hour belongs to the Negro. You know, we just fought a civil war for Black rights, in other words. This hour belongs to the Negro. And Cady Stanton answered him, do you believe the African race is composed entirely of males? In fact, one might argue that the people most in need of voting rights uh, coming out of the Civil War and into the Reconstruction period were Black women. Women who were doubly discriminated against because of race as well as their sex but black women and all women are left out of the 15th Amendment. So Stanton and Anthony say, we will not endorse the 15th Amendment. Yes, uh, we are longtime advocates of black rights, but this amendment didn't go far enough, we renounce it. And instead we are going to work for a federal uh, constitution amendment that grants all women the right to vote. So, um, the American Women's Suffrage Association, AWSA, pro 15th Amendment, as the final wording has it, black male suffrage. The National Woman Suffrage Association, the NWSA, headed by uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, anti 15th Amendment, because women weren't included. The AWSA, we will still achieve women's suffrage, but we will do it changing state law by state law, working through state legislatures. The NWSA, no, constitutional amendment. A constitutional amendment that grants voting rights to all adult citizens. Now, 
I read, shared with you, the language of the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. That language became um, something that members of the NWSA took very serious note of and said, well, if all persons, and it doesn't say male persons in that first part of the amendment, just persons, uh, all persons who are born in the U.S. or have achieved naturalization or citizens and they're entitled to all rights of citizenship, maybe that gives a little entree for women to vote. Okay, we were left out of the 15th Amendment, but that all persons language in the 14th Amendment says, hey, we women are citizens. Let's test that and see if rights of female citizenship can encompass the right to vote. All right, so um, 14th Amendment, 1868, all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. are U.S. citizens. 15th Amendment, person cannot be denied voting rights on the basis of race, uh, color, previous condition of servitude. Um, the next election after uh, the 15th Amendment, next presidential election after the 15th Amendment has become part of the Constitution is the presidential election of 1872. And so members of the NWSA decide we're going to test the 14th Amendment and see if it can possibly be stretched to allow women voting rights, even though they were left out of the 15th Amendment. So a variety of members of uh, the NWSA, uh, National Woman Suffrage Association around the country decided to test that premise that if women are citizens, they automatically should have the right to suffrage. And uh, women who were affiliated with the NWSA attempted to register to vote or actually to vote in the presidential election of 1872. Um, among those who uh, attempted to vote in the 1872 presidential election was Susan B. Anthony herself, back in her hometown of Rochester, New York. Uh, she was arrested uh, for voting and uh, was uh, required to pay a fine. Another woman uh, affiliated with the NWSA is a woman named Virginia Minor, who lives in St. Louis, Missouri. She, in fact, is the president of the Missouri branch of the NWSA, Virginia Minor. She doesn't make it as far as uh, Susan B. Anthony did in Rochester, New York. Susan B. Anthony, uh, I guess, uh, when she went to register to vote, found a very um, understanding registrant who let her register, but uh, then she got in trouble when she actually uh, cast her ballot at the polling place. Uh, Virginia Minor, however, uh, went to her uh, local uh, election office and attempted to register to vote in her hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, and was denied by uh, the man who was uh, the registrar, a man named Reese Happersett. Um, so Virginia Minor testing the 14th Amendment, hey, I'm a citizen. 14th Amendment says, if you're born in this country, and I was, you're automatically a citizen, birthright citizenship, I have that. I'm going to see if that automatically allows me the right to vote. I go to register, me, Virginia Minor, uh, and Mr. Reese Happersett says, no, as a woman, you cannot register to vote. So Virginia Minor and her husband, Sue Reese Happersett, in uh, a court case that eventually makes it all the way to the Supreme Court and goes by the name Minder v. Happersett, uh, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1874. I will sue uh, Reese Happersett for denying me my right as a, an American citizen under the 14th Amendment to vote. That is Virginia Minor's argument in not allowing me to register to vote, Reese Happersett of St. Louis, Missouri, the registrar at my election office when I went to register to vote, 
he has denied me one of my rights of citizenship under the 14th Amendment. Of course, it takes a while uh, once a suit has been filed to make its way through the court system and end up at the Supreme Court. Um, it's a couple of years after the 1872 election that the Supreme Court decides unanimously in its 1874 Minor v. Happersett decision that Virginia Minor, Susan B. Anthony, no woman citizen automatically has the right to vote, even though the 14th Amendment has defined citizenship. And if you are a woman who was born in the US, you're automatically a US citizen. Um, that doesn't mean you're automatically, once you reach adulthood, a voter. So let me read you some of the language from the Minor v. Happersett decision of 1874. Uh, as I said, was a unanimous decision. The closing language of the decision is this. For nearly 90 years, the people have acted upon the idea that the Constitution, when it conferred citizenship, did not necessarily confer the right of suffrage. Okay, uh, the Supreme Court is saying this is has been the common wisdom of the situation. For nearly 90 years, the people have acted upon the idea that the Constitution, when it conferred citizenship, did not necessarily confer the right of suffrage. We are now automatically uh, going to say that is the law. We've stated it here plainly. Just because you're a citizen doesn't mean you have the right to vote. This has been the understanding, now we're putting it in uh, language as plain as day. This is now the official Supreme Court sanctioned interpretation of the Constitution. The decision goes on. Our province is to decide what the law is, not to declare what it should be. Well, that gives a little opening, doesn't it? Uh, to members of the NWSA. Oh, are those nine old men of the Supreme Court suggesting maybe the law isn't what it should be? But they say it's not in their province to decide what it should be. The province of the Supreme Court is to decide the meaning of the law that already exists. We have given this case the careful consideration its importance demands. If the law is wrong, it ought to be changed. But the power for that is not with us. No argument as to woman's need of suffrage can be considered. We can only act upon her rights as they exist. We can look at the language of the Minor v. Happersett decision and say it was a defeat for Virginia Minor and other members of the NWSA. They were told, yeah, you're citizens under the 14th Amendment. Earlier in its decision, the Supreme Court said, oh, Mrs. Minor's citizenship was never in doubt. We recognize she's a citizen but that doesn't automatically make her a voter just because she's a citizen. But if the law is wrong, it ought to be changed. If the law is wrong, it ought to be changed. But that's not our job as members of the Supreme Court. But that certainly seems to leave the door open. Is the Supreme Court, in fact, saying, hey, women of America, if you want to change your status, if you want women's citizenship to also mean that women are voters, maybe the law ought to be changed and maybe the constitution should be changed. So in some ways, uh, this decision, Minor v. Happersett in 1874, gave members of the NWSA their marching orders. Go ahead change the Constitution. That is certainly the way that uh, 
the leaders of the NWSA, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony read this decision. We must go forward and change the constitution in a way that the Supreme Court justices can never deny an adult woman citizen the right to vote, that it's going to automatically be the case. Not that you're a citizen, but if the constitution doesn't spell it out, you're a voter. But instead, you're a citizen and the constitution does spell it out that you're a voter automatically. And this intensifies the determination of Katie Stanton and Anthony, we need a constitutional amendment to the US Constitution. Now, how will the women of the NWSA, how will they convince new male allies in Congress uh, to support such a proposition that there should be a federal amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote. We can't rely on our old allies in the movement for a 13th Amendment. If Charles Sumner, of all people, the uh, closest male ally we had in the US Congress, the most pro-woman ally, the most pro-woman's rights ally in the US Congress says it's the Negro's hour. And by that, he means it's the black man's hour, we have to start finding new allies. Sumner can still be a political ally with Lucy Stone, with Henry Blackwell, with the AWSA uh, members who support the 15th Amendment and say it's fine that it's black male suffrage. We members of the NWSA looking for a women's suffrage amendment to the constitution. We're not gonna trust those white office holders who were with us in the abolitionist movement, said they were pro-women, but wouldn't put such language in the 15th amendment. We have to look for allies elsewhere. Well, where is that going to be as reconstruction nears its end? Here in 1876, the United States is uh, about to celebrate its centennial. When I speak to my students about the uh, centennial celebration in 1876, I'm of course talking to people who weren't around at the time of the bicentennial celebration in 1976, but uh, here with my lakeside Chautauqua audience, I'm sure many of you were, uh, of course we were in the age of television um, and uh, jet travel, and we had a, a bicentennial celebration in 1976 that was truly national in scope. We would you know, watch programming about uh, the founders of the nation on TV. Um, I remember my family uh, took a trip. I grew up in Kansas, but we took a trip all the way out to Williamsburg, uh, Virginia to tour um, Williamsburg as part of our summer of 1976 celebration. It was a nationwide celebration uh, given the realities of communication and transportation technology in the 20th century. In the 19th century, however, the centennial celebration, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the US was very much centered in the city where uh, independence was declared the city of Philadelphia. So all roads led to Philadelphia in 1876. The celebrations surrounding the centennial were all centered in that city. Um, here we see a couple of uh, images from that centennial celebration of centennial flag. Uh, interestingly enough with uh, Columbia, a female image on the, on the flag. And it was also here in uh, seven, in excuse me, 1876 in Philadelphia, that uh, a portion of the Statue of Liberty, also an al a female allegorical figure, was first on display. Uh, her arm holding up the the torch of liberty is on display here in Philadelphia. So uh, all roads lead to Philadelphia and the celebration of 
the U.S. centennial, and that includes uh, women of the NWSA, show up at Philadelphia, where there is to be a dramatic reading of the Declaration of Independence at the front of Independence Hall by the descendants of one of the signers of the Declaration is going to stand in front of uh, Independence Hall and dramatically read Thomas Jefferson's words. Members of the NWSA had uh, contacted organizers of the centennial celebration here in Philadelphia and said, well, we want to be there too. We want um, suffrage, women suffrage activists to be represented at the centennial celebration. And we want to give a presentation about how we haven't yet fulfilled the promise of the American Revolution. Um, it's not just Jefferson's words, all men are created equal, uh, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton's words of 1848 in the Declaration of Sentiments, all men and women are created equal. Well, again, sort of like the Supreme Court two years earlier in 1874, the organizers of the centennial celebration here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, say, well, we're here to celebrate what's been done, not what is left to be done. We're here to celebrate American accomplishments at the centennial celebration, not bring up work that is yet to be done. That again implies, hey, you, you may have a point there. Maybe women should have voting rights, uh, but we're not celebrating you know, places where the promise of the revolution has perhaps fallen short, but where it succeeded. So um, as uh, the descendant of one of the signers is at the front of Independence Hall about to give his speech, Susan B. Anthony goes through the crowd there and passes out leaflets uh, that protest uh, women's exclusion uh, from voting rights here at the time that the nation is celebrating its 100th birthday. She distributes the leaflets and she has some uh, of her allies with her there too, being mildly disruptive, you know, passing out the leaflets. They're not shouting or, uh, you know, jumping up and down or anything, just mildly disruptive, passing out leaflets for the suffrage cause. And then they walk around to the back of Independence Hall and Susan B. Anthony uh, gives this address, uh, declaration and protest of the women of the United States. And uh, you see here, sponsored by the NWSA. Uh, so on July 4th, 1876, from the back of Independence Hall, Susan B. Anthony delivers an address that begins to indicate where suffragists are going in terms of getting new allies among uh, American office holders at the federal level. Uh, we can't go back to our antebellum, our pre-Civil War allies. They sold us out with the wording of the 15th Amendment. We have to go in a new direction. Now, although it's Susan B. Anthony who delivers the address, it has largely been written by her close colleague, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. If you were in attendance this morning and heard uh, my lecture this morning, I talked about Elizabeth Cady Stanton being a married woman with a, a large family and being tied down by her domestic responsibilities and her responsibilities of motherhood. Susan B. Anthony never married. And so although she was the public face and voice of the NWSA, the, the words that she often shared on those occasions when she was out uh, speaking publicly, and again, she's a Quaker. Susan B. Anthony is a Quaker. And again, if you heard my comments this morning, you know that uh, women from the Quaker tradition uh, were more used to public speaking than other women of this era because in the Quaker meetings, women could get up if the spirit moved them and, and speak to a so-called mixed or promiscuous, as it was called, crowd of men and women. Uh, because there was no formal uh, clergy in uh, the Quaker religion, the Society of Friends, men or women could get up and speak at meetings. And some became very 
famous women preachers, such as uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's mentor, Lucretia Mott. Susan B. Anthony is from that religious tradition. She's used to women getting up and, and speaking. She was not as comfortable uh, in that role as uh, Lucretia Mott had been, but um, she got out there and she did it. But her uh, words were often written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Cady Stanton, who couldn't get away uh, from her domestic responsibilities, uh, would write the words. She was the ideal woman uh, for the 19th century suffrage movement as a whole. She was the leading intellectual light of the movement and particularly for those suffragists who are affiliated with the NWSA, those who want a constitutional amendment granting women suffrage. So she writes these words, uh, but it's the single woman who uh, can travel around, doesn't have the domestic responsibilities. It's Susan B. Anthony who delivers these words. And um, there is reference made in this speech of July 4th, 1876 to the Minor v. Happerset decision. There is reference made to uh, the revolutionary generation. There's reference made to Abigail Adams as Susan B. Anthony speaks here. Abigail Adams, the wife of one president and mother of another uh, had said, uh, you should remember the ladies, right? Uh, she had written from Braintree, Massachusetts in July of 1776 to her husband in Philadelphia, remember the ladies. She was asking that those British common law customs of coveture that I spoke about this morning be renounced uh, in the Declaration of Independence. Of course, that didn't happen. So Anthony makes reference here, speaking the words of Elizabeth Cady Stanton to US history, now celebrating its centennial. She makes reference to current events, to the Minor v. Happerset decision of the Supreme Court only two years earlier. Of course, she comments on that decision unfavorably. She notes that a new state has entered the union here in 1876, Colorado. Like all her elder sisters comes into the union with the invidious word male in her constitution. Male citizens only will have the right to vote. So she makes many references here uh, to current events and to history. But here is some of the problematic language that is now finding its way into the rhetoric of the suffrage crusade. Our faith is firm and unwavering in the broad principles of human rights proclaimed in 1776, not only as abstract truths, but as the cornerstones of a republic. Yet, we cannot forget, even in this glad hour, that while all men of every race and clime and condition have been invested with the full rights of citizenship under our hospitable flag, all women still suffer the degradation of disenfranchisement. Hmm. All men of every race, clime, and condition, every race, black men, every clime, maybe Southern black men, uh, maybe men who have come from the other side of the world an entirely different climate, maybe immigrant men who have been naturalized, men of every condition. Maybe that condition is that of being a former slave. But women, all women are denied the right to vote. See, this language today may begin to strike us as racist, as nativist, these are rhetorical strategies that start creeping into the suffrage movement as reconstruction nears its end. We see that portion of the suffragists who have aligned themselves with the National Women's Suffrage Association, we see them start courting white lawmakers 
from the South. People who, like them, members of the NWSA, are disappointed in the language of the 15th Amendment, although for different reasons. White Southern lawmakers are disappointed because any Blacks have been given the right to vote by the 15th Amendment. NWSA women are angry because only Black males were given that right in the 15th Amendment. She goes on, uh, the right of trial by a jury of one's peers was so jealously guarded that states refused to ratify the original constitution until it was guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment. The right to trial by jury of one's peers. And yet the women of this nation have never been allowed a jury of their peers being tried in all cases by men, native and foreign, educated and ignorant, virtuous and vicious. Young girls have been arraigned in our courts for the crime of infanticide, tried, convicted, hanged, victims perchance of judge jurors advocates, while no woman's voice could be heard in their defense. She brings up a uniquely female crime of um, infanticide to cover uh, the reality of an unwanted pregnancy. And yet, if a young woman is brought up on charges that um, she murdered her baby from an unwanted, uh, very likely um, outside a marital relationship pregnancy, there are not going to be any sympathetic woman jurors. Jury pools are pulled from the voting rolls, only men are on the voting rolls, and the problematic language, and what kind of men. It could be any kind of man. Ignorant, foreign-born, vicious. Again, we can look at this language and say, well, when she's talking about the ignorant, the vicious, is she perhaps alluding to the black male voter? Obviously, the foreign born, she's referring to immigrants. So again, elements of racism and nativism are creeping into the suffragist vocabulary, particularly the suffragists aligned with the NWSA. They need to get new male office holder allies. We have to look to the former Confederacy and of course, the year after she speaks these words uh, is the last year of Reconstruction, the last of the federal troops come out of the South and Reconstruction comes to an end. And the federal government is no longer enforcing the reforms of the Reconstruction period. And many former Confederates calling themselves redeemers uh, redeem uh, their power in the South uh, and in those uh, Southern delegations that are sent to Washington. So we see some very, very unfortunate language enter the suffrage movement out of uh, this mindset that we have to look for new allies. And they may be allies who wanted nothing to do with us before the Civil War. In fact, stood against everything we were for were proponents of slavery, not enemies of slavery. There's that old saying, politics makes strange bedfellows. Uh, that is the risk, apparently, Stanton and Anthony and others affiliated, many others affiliated with the NWSA, that's a risk they're willing to take. Uh, adopt this problematic language that obviously is going to alienate black women. Uh, you know, Sojourner Truth lives several years beyond this speech that Susan B. Anthony gives at the time of the centennial celebration. Will people like her feel welcome in the suffrage movement? 
any longer once language uh, such as expressed here in this centennial speech, once language like this is being used to try to attract new allies in the suffrage struggle. Now, what Stanton and Anthony are betting on is that white male lawmakers from the South will, um, for the first time, be in favor of women's suffrage if they think of women's suffrage specifically as white women's suffrage. That they will be pro-suffrage if their idea of the woman voter is the white woman voter. So although um, increasingly, as the 19th century continues, Susan B. Anthony, who's the one out there being, as I said, the face and the voice of the NWSA, even though the words uh, oftentimes have been originally written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony uh, will, when she's in the North giving speeches, uh, talk to integrated, racially integrated audiences, and uh, will spend time with black uh, suffragists such as Ida B. Wells. Um, they were friends and uh, allies, but she never uh, talked about her friendship, Susan B. Anthony, uh, with Ida B. Wells, famous black uh, woman suffragist, uh, journalist, would not reference the fact that they were uh, friends and allies in reform when Susan B. Anthony was in the South. And when she was in the South, she spoke to segregated audiences. It was um, a case of uh, the NWSA having sort of one face in the North and another face in the South. Um, but either way, Black women are feeling uh, less inclined to see this as a movement in which they are 100% welcome, although that does not deter many Black women from remaining in the suffrage movement. So although this, this morning I was talking about the origins of the suffrage movement and Black women being there from the beginning and the white women in the movement also embracing sisterhood with Black women, that's going to fall apart here in Reconstruction. This divide caused by the wording um, well, not caused by the wording of the 15th Amendment, but reaction to that wording. So it's not that members of the NWSA and its leadership, Stanton and Anthony, it's not that they exclusively used nativist and uh, racist rhetoric in their public pronouncements. Um, I'm sitting here at my office at Ohio University and I'm not far away, uh, just about halfway across campus, is uh, this plaque you see here on the right commemorating uh, Susan B. Anthony's speech here in Athens, Ohio, a couple of years, a little over two years after she gave her centennial speech in Philadelphia. She comes here to Athens. Uh, she's on a speaking tour here in the Midwest and she gives a speech at uh, the Athens City Hall. The photograph of her here at the left is about what she would have looked like here in 1878. She speaks at Athens City Hall, October 19th, 1878. And uh, I looked through uh, the OU and Athens archives at uh, the university library doing research on this speech and None of the sources that I found uh, that recreate portions of this speech show Anthony um, engaging in any of that problematic rhetoric. Uh, no words that we would look at today and say, hey, that has at least racist overtones. Uh, oh, uh, that is outright nativist language. No, we don't see that. Instead, the uh, address that she gave here in Athens was entitled, Woman Wants Bread, Not the Ballot. That was the title of her speech. And of course, uh, that was a speech with a provocative title. You know, she's hoping to attract people. Oh, Susan B. Anthony, one of the most prominent 
activists in behalf of women's suffrage says woman wants bread, not the ballot. Well, that title uh, meant to intrigue people, urge people to show up. What will she be talking about? Provocative title here. Um, was misleading, of course, because her speech was all about women do want the ballot, but they want the ballot not as an end in itself, but because it will provide uh, for greater equality and dignity in all aspects of their life. And this goes back to that Declaration of, of Sentiments document I discussed this morning with all of its many resolutions uh, for changing women's status in US society. And as you recall, one of the resolutions was that a, wo a woman and women uh, should be able to pursue the same kind of wage earning opportunities as men. And so with this title, Woman Wants Bread, Not the Ballot, it was uh, the idea expressed that if women had the ballot, they would be able to uh, achieve a better status in American society, be better able uh, to make an independent wage. And this would be something that as a single woman, uh, Susan B. Anthony uh, would be very concerned about. And so uh, she's assuming people will understand that. Uh, she had been a school teacher uh, earlier in her life, which was the um, dominant middle class type of employment for unmarried women. Uh, so she'd been a school teacher, but that really uh, was not uh, a vocation she had enjoyed. Uh, what if she could have been a lawyer, a doctor, uh, a college professor, uh, if she had been able to uh, be employed in a type of work that middle class men had access to. So she's talking about if women get the ballot, they can better ensure they have greater equality with men in wage earning, in access to higher education, and all these other ways uh, that women that women are demanding, uh, did demand in the Declaration of Sentiments. We want equality with men in all these walks of life. Why are we so focused on the ballot? Because if we have the ballot, we can better ensure that we have these other equalities with men. Um, once we have the ballot, everything else has the possibility of falling into place if women have that political empowerment. So it wasn't exclusively nativist or racist language that finds its way into the post-Civil War rhetoric of the suffrage movement, but it is there. Let me show you um, a poster of the late 19th century. That certainly shows these new uh, problematic suffrage strategies. The caption here is American woman and her political peers. The woman at the center of the poster, and, and as you see there by the original copyright date, it's from the 1890s, it was still uh, a poster that was being displayed and circulated um, during the last decade of the suffrage struggle. Uh, the renewed copyright there is 1911. Ah, so these problematic strategies are still in place. It wasn't just uh, a post reconstruction, post-Civil War rhetorical strategy. It continues even into the 20th century. The woman at the center here, I wonder if any of you recognize her. She's not just any white woman. That's Frances Willard. She was the second president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Uh, at the point when this poster is first created and distributed, she was one of the most admired women in America. 
Um, remember in my comments this morning, I said that so many of the people who had reform experience before coming to the suffrage movement had been involved in, of course, the abolitionist movement, but also the temperance movement. And although Francis Willard is not the first president of the WCTU, which was, by the way, founded here in Ohio, uh, she's the second president and she is um, charismatic. Um, she is a woman of boundless energy and she really makes it into a major force in American politics, even before most women have the right to vote. She embraces what she calls the do everything policy, which is, yeah, well, we should work to outlaw the sale and consumption of alcohol, but we as women should be involved in all kinds of reform that make American society um, better, particularly for women and for children and uh, for American homes. She called it her home protection policy as well, her do everything home protection policy. And so she becomes an advocate of women's suffrage. Uh, she says, if women have the right to vote, they can put so many other reforms in place. If women have the right to vote, they can vote for uh, temperance laws. They can vote uh, in uh, temperance-minded male politicians and maybe even temperance-minded women themselves with voting rights will be able to vote for uh, women candidates who are temperance-minded. We have to be a society that outlaws the sale and use of alcohol because the chief victims of alcohol are women and children in the American home. Um, this is long before alcoholism is recognized as a disease. That won't be until the 1920s. Instead, if a person drinks to excess, uh, he, and it, the, the person who is an alcohol abuser is very much gendered masculine. He is um, a person of lax morals. It's not that he has a disease. That wasn't understood at this time. Um, the drunkard, as he was called, the drunkard has failed morally. And he spends his paycheck on booze instead of paying the rent or paying the mortgage. And if he comes home drunk, he may beat the children. He may beat his wife. So Francis Willard says the Woman's Christian Temperance Union must embrace suffrage so we can vote in so-called dry candidates, anti-liquor candidates, so we can vote in laws that outlaw the sale and use of alcohol. And actually the largest women's suffrage organization by the time we get to the 19th century is not the NWSA or the AWSA. What have become single issue organizations, right? Remember that broad list of demands from the Declaration of Sentiments. It's become more narrowed now to the vote, right? That speech that Susan B. Anthony gave here in Athens, Ohio. If we get the ballot, then we'll get all those other things, those things that we so desperately need. Access to a better wage, access to a better education, etc. But the Women's Christian Temperance Union becomes the largest women's suffrage organization. It's not a single issue organization. It is an organization that is primarily dedication, dedicated to stamping out alcohol abuse. But as a means to that end, it's a pro-suffrage organization. Give women the ballot and they'll make this a dry country. So by putting at the center of this poster uh, an image of Francis Willard, the head of the largest pro-women suffrage organization in the country is put at the center of this poster. She can't vote because she is a woman. Frances Willard, a woman at the center of this poster, very admired woman, the state of Illinois in Statuary Hall in the US Capitol, right? Every state gets two statues. Frances Willard's 
statue goes in there relatively early, uh, long before other states started putting um, images of women in Statuary Hall. The state of Illinois knows uh, Frances Willard is the most famous, uh, most influential woman uh, in the US in the late decades of the 19th century. Most famous woman in America, uh, most influential, head of the largest pro-women suffrage organization. She doesn't have voting rights. And here she is in the middle of this poster. And who are surrounding her? Her political peers. And if you read the fine print here, the language is very dated and very problematic. She is here classed politically with so-called idiots, the image in the upper left, the convict, the image in the upper right, the insane, the image in the lower right, and the Indian, the image in the lower left. Now, my students oftentimes look at this poster and say, you know, we see some unfortunate caricatures here. The so-called idiot, using the words of the 1890s, um, today we might say a mentally challenged person, looks like a lot of the caricatures and cartoons of the 1890s of the Jewish immigrant. Is the so-called idiot meant to represent the immigrant man? Not yet naturalized and therefore does not yet have the voting rights that Francis Willard also lacks, but he can become naturalized maybe. Um, but if we just read this language as it is and not think of the caricatures of the period and just say he's a mentally challenged person, the so-called idiot, um, Here's the fine, upstanding, most famous woman of her generation, Frances Willard, and she's classed the same as a mentally challenged man. He doesn't have political rights. Neither does the convict, who my students say they believe is uh, very definitely represented as a black man. Again, um, black men have been given voting rights. Now, of course, if the black man has been convicted of a felon and he was a convict uh, of a felony, and he's a felon and he's a convict, he can't vote. But again, maybe some unfortunate um, racial themes coming into this poster. Uh, the insane man, you know, with the uh, crazy eyes and for some reason carrying around a battered hat on a stick, I suppose he's meant to be a rep represent uh, obviously a mentally ill person who just sort of wanders around and is unemployed. Uh, and living very much on the margins of society. Well, he uh, is not allowed to vote, but neither is a fine upstanding middle-class woman like Frances Willard and the American Indian. I mean, there's an obvious racial theme coming in here. Uh, this middle-class white woman is classed uh, as being politically equal to an indigenous American who at this point, um, the vast majority of Native American men do not have the right to vote. Neither does Francis Willard. So you see here some of the problematic racial, social, class, ethnic, nativist themes being played out in this poster. And these are some of the strategies that increasingly the suffrage movement is using. How can you deny the most fine, upstanding white woman the vote? You make her the equal of these problematic men. Um, again, by the standards of 2020, boy, these are um, distressing images, but it might also strike a black woman at this time as problematic. A Native American woman, an immigrant woman, a working class woman, uh, where the face of suffrage is in this poster, literally the white 
well-educated middle class would-be woman voter. So it's here as the 19th century is ending that we see the suffrage movement very much losing its original vision of suffrage for all women. Um, it is the white middle class woman, native born, who is being set up as the woman voter. Other women, if they're there at all, are placed in the background. And in my comments tomorrow about the 20th century uh, suffrage movement, I will talk to you more uh, about those kinds of issues and problems in uh, the 20th century um, suffrage movement. Uh, only here as the 19th century is coming to a close and women's suffrage um, is still not a reality. A few states, Wyoming has granted women the right to vote, Utah has granted women the right to vote. But uh, as the 19th century is coming to an end, most American women still don't have the right to vote, that these two competing organizations come back together, the American Woman Suffrage Association and the National Woman Suffrage Association merge. Neither one of us has accomplished here at Century's End uh, universal, which increasingly means white, uh, women's suffrage. Um, it isn't a reality. Um, we've been perhaps working at cross purposes. At Century's End, the two organizations have come back together and they are calling themselves the National American Woman Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. And very early in the 20th century, both Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who have leadership positions in this newly merged organization, uh, they will die without seeing women's suffrage become a reality from coast to coast. Uh, and the new generation, which I'll be talking about tomorrow, along with continuing some of, uh, some of this problematic rhetoric in terms of race, in terms of class, in terms of uh, nativity, um, they will initially, the new NAWSA, will initially uh, take that state-by-state -state approach that uh, Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell had with the AWSA. They will uh, lay aside the Stanton and Anthony idea of an amendment and adopt the state-by-state -state approach. So in my comments tomorrow, I guess I'll tell you how that worked out for them uh, and uh, show you again uh, some images of uh, the suffragists who will continue the crusade into the 20th century as well as um, show you some uh, images sim similar to those I've shared with you today uh, that make suffrage increasingly look like a white women's movement. Okay, I will open things up now to questions. Hi. All right. Hello, back again. Um, well, we will give a few minutes here for questions to come in. We do have, um, like I said, a bit of a delay from the, the Facebook page and the webinar. But one thing I wanted to point out too, I, it was interesting when you uh, brought up about Frances Willard at, the time that she um, started to become more popular with the WCTU, she spoke at Lakeside um, in 1878 and she was scheduled to speak again in 1890. Um, and I'm interested to look into our archives to figure out why, but her program was canceled that year. Well, she dies uh, at a young age. So she was not well and, and died shortly after uh, she would have been scheduled for that presentation. This is a, gr mm -hmm. uh, a great book. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Dakota yeah. or others. Uh, Sisters, The Lives of America's Suffragists by Jean H. Baker. And it, uh, as, as we see here, here's Frances Willard. Um, Alice Paul, I'll talk about her tomorrow. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, and Susan B. Anthony. And um, by 
certainly by the standards of the 19th century, the other four women lived long, long lives. I mean, they definitely uh, lived past the average age for women born in the 19th century, but Frances Willard dies at a, at a young age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one other, um, I guess, interesting uh, note from Lakeside history, at least that ties in, um, Susan B. Anthony spoke here at Lakeside as well. I if she ever did. She did, and one of the really fascinating parts of that when I was first learning about it, um, there's some funny stories, well, interesting stories that go along with it, but she was there filling in for Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, which was hilarious the first time that I read about it because I thought Susan B. Anthony as a fill-in is a uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> much different idea. Yeah, um, and of course, again, to use that anachronistic term, um, what, what year was Lakeside founded? 1873. 1873. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's uh, herself becoming uh, an empty nester, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and so is getting out more and, and making more uh, public appearances herself. But she had some health problems. She uh, was overweight, and it became very difficult mm -hmm. for her even after she didn't have the child rearing responsibilities. Um, it became difficult for her to travel because mm -hmm. of her weight and um, health problems associated with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas Susan B. Anthony was uh, more, <laughs> was more of the ectomorph and, uh, <laughs> and didn't have the health problems. Didn't have those attached. Um, well, I think with all the information that you've given us just today, um, maybe what we'll do is we'll leave it open for everyone. If they have questions, they can come back with them again tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Jellison will be joining us again at 10.30 a.m. and at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow for two more lectures to continue this history. Um, and as uh, Dr. Durack said yesterday, too, there's, there's so much here. There's so many characters at play. Um, so as we go along throughout this week, I'm sure that all of our speakers will be thrilled to answer any questions that anyone has. That's for sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. And thank you everyone um, who's been involved. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. I'll be here. All right. We'll thank you. you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>